Hello! In this video, we would like to do a very simple experiment to hopefully get a better understanding of how randomness works. Let's say I toss a coin, a fair coin, one with the heads and tails, each with a probability 50%. So our probability of observing the heads is equal to 50%, or the way we say it in probability theory, 0.5. Now, if I toss this coin many times, what happens? I have done just that using computer simulation where I tossed the coin 300 times and here are the results, okay? So the first thing we notice and we expect is that as the number of coin tosses increases, the portion of heads grows closer and closer to 50%. So here we could expect that the coin landed on heads close to 150 times and tails close to 150 times. Using computer simulation, you can see that there is some fluctuation in the beginning because the number of coin tosses is still small. However, as the number of tosses increases, the portion of heads becomes closer and closer to 0.5, which is 50%. So that's why we say that the probability of heads is 50% in this case. That this is called the law of large numbers, and we will revisit this concept later on in this course. This law is applicable to many situations in real life. A very simple example of the law of large numbers that's usually given in probability courses involves casinos. Casinos take advantage of the law of large numbers because many many people play at the casino and the casino has a slight edge in every game. The casino always makes money although an individual gambler may lose money or win money. As I said, we will discuss the issue of the law of large numbers and how to take advantage of it in real life later. But let's look again at our long sequence of heads and tails more closely and see if we can observe some interesting events. If I tell you that I toss a coin and I observe three heads in a row, what do you think will be the probability of a fourth toss resulting in tails? Is tails more likely after three heads? Well, some people might think that since we have observed a lot of heads, we need to observe one tails, but that's of course incorrect. In fact, the probability of heads or tails is still 50%. So in other words, the coin does not have any memory. In fact, in probability theory, we say that these coin tosses are independent. So this is the concept of independence. We will go back to it more carefully later on. But what we are saying here is that if we toss a coin, it doesn't matter what the previous results were. Whether you have previously observed heads or tails, the next one is still just as likely to be heads as it is tails. Our intuition is sometimes wrong in these kinds of scenarios. For example, people make the same mistake when they are investing. Some people say, okay, th so the stock price of a company has gone down three times in the past three days, so it has to go up. Unfortunately, this way of thinking is fairly naive. Realistically, if you are going to be looking at it investing, your thinking should be a little bit more sophisticated and rational than that. In these situations, this kind of intuitive approach is not usually useful. We will go back to this situation and investing later on, but my point here is that sometimes in real life, the situation is not as obvious as it may appear when dealing with randomness. Now, what are the consequences of the independence of coin tosses? Let's look once more at this large sequence of heads and tails. Now, what we observe here is a random kind of sequence, but let's look at the sequences of consecutive heads or tails. For example, here I have five heads in a row, right? Now, how many of these types of sequences do we have here? I have highlighted some of them. We have six tails here, five heads here, we actually have seven heads in a row here, six tails in a row here, and so on. So there are a lot of long sequences of consecutive heads or consecutive tails which looks a little bit strange to us. The reason it's strange is that if I asked a person to write down a random sequence of heads or tails, they would usually not produce this kind of long tail of consecutive heads or tails. Usually, if you wanted to write down a random sequence, you would tend to write, for example, heads, tails, heads, maybe another heads, then tails, and so on. So this looks more random to us, but what happens is that, in reality, randomness creates large clusters. The clustering of long sequences of tails or heads we observe here. Clustering inevitably happens when you have a long random sequences of something like heads or tails. So this is another kind of counterintuitive thing we encounter, and this too has real life implications. For example, suppose a gambler goes to the casino and happens to win three times in a row. So that person might say, oh, this is my lucky night, so I should continue gambling more. Obviously, this is a fallacy, because a gambler is not more likely to make money. What's happening here is simple clustering. So the gambler might choose to continue gambling and think it's his lucky night, but in reality he's probably gonna lose a lot of money. 
The same issue could happen when, for example, in basketball, a player may have what is called a hot hand, which means that this player has been making a lot of their shots successfully at a specific point in the game. Then other players start passing the ball to this person because they appear to be on a roll. This again is a fallacy because when a player shoots the ball, there is a certain probability that the player will make a basket or not. Due to the nature of randomness, it might happen that the player is successful three times in a row and so on. It does not mean that the player is more skilled at this particular time in the game. It is simply randomness at work. This happens in our everyday lives as well. For example, you might say two, three, or four bad events happen in the same day once in a while. Again, this is bound to happen because of the nature of randomness. Clustering occurs and numerous events, good or bad, could clump together in one day. So we should expect that some days three things go wrong at the same time. Say my car breaks down, my child is sick at home, and so on. Due to randomness, we should expect days like this even though they are unpleasant. This leads to my next question. How do we prepare for such days? The idea here is that we have to have some sort of margin or cushion when we are planning our days or projects. What this means is that if you plan your days so that everything is ruined, if one thing goes wrong, then you are not allowing enough of a margin, right? So for example, if you are traveling somewhere, it's always good to add a margin. If you have an appointment or a meeting, it's always good to leave early in case your car breaks down or you run into bad weather. This way, you will have enough of a margin to take care of the situation and then continue about your day. To summarize, there are two lessons here. First, we should expect these kind of bad events to sometimes occur altogether, so we should not be surprised when they happen, but we should allow enough of a margin to be able to handle them. Secondly, we shouldn't be disappointed when these things happen. Don't think that you are having an unlucky day or something like that. By a matter of randomness, these things just simply happen. Of course, these examples are fairly simple, but we will go into the probabilistic arguments in greater depth later on in this course. Thank you for watching.